Um, How are your midterms? Have you all done yet? Uh, yeah, I already did my I only have two. Oh wow. What were those in? Uh planning and uh, calculus. Yeah, yeah tough. Not discrete, really. Did you have more exams for midterms for like third year? Well, I'm in third year, right? So I, I know we had quite a few midterms. They just had them like in class. I guess maybe some props, especially in the concept field. I think I've been hearing around that they're less likely to give as many examinations and they're more looking to assignments and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like there might be some truth in that. Um, that's good though, almost done. How many exams do you have? That's kind of an interesting question. You're four, okay, so you do have a bit. That's tough. Are they, are they like doing in-person exams this year? I, I don't know, because I'm not. Yeah, at least for calculus, we had everybody going to the same room. Oh yeah, so just like in Roz. Right. Yeah. Was it tough? Uh, I mean, I, I wasn't too bad. It was too bad, okay. And then some people can do so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Do you find that a lot of it is review from high school? Do you get the, the chance to do a lot of that stuff in high school? Um, whatever, like I was in some programs, but most of the stuff I have already done before. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. That's cool. Where uh, where are you from? Sorry, if you don't mind me asking. Okay, so yeah, same here. Yeah. Wait, what high school did you go to? Uh, White Oaks. White Oaks, okay. I live right by Oaks. I live in Clarkson area. Okay, so, by the Grove Green Circuit? Yeah, right by there. It's like my area. I went to Port Credit though, so. Okay. A little different. Which side of the station do you live? So I live by uh, South Side, so by the lake. Okay, I live Sheridan Side. Yes, 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 right yes. Oh yeah, no way! Yeah. Wow, it's pretty cool. That's pretty crazy. Cool. Looks like we're getting the cast in. I think a lot of people are switching over to the Zoom. <laughs> Can't blame them. Um, also, I'm gonna get your name at the end of this. I'll have everyone on Zoom's name for the attendance. Sarah's not gonna be here today. So uh, I'll just, I'll grab it, be okay. Let me actually get that up. So, he's here. Cool. Good to see you guys. We'll start in five minutes. Like I said before, I hope you guys can hear me. Audio is all good.
Okay. Awesome. Um, I'll start very soon. Benjamin, are you in? It's uh, it's showing that you're joining in the waiting room. It's also showing that you're joined. Kind of strange. Is everything working? Okay, awesome. Glad to hear. Glad to hear. Okay, thank you for showing up today, guys. Good work. Almost halfway there. You guys almost got your certificates. It's great to see familiar uh, names in the chat. Sure. <laughs> Shouldn't give it two more minutes, so. Grab a coffee. <laughs> Are they not on right now? They are. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, sure. I think it's a while. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just so that I can on the line. Okay. Peter's here. Okay, with that. It's just about time. I'm getting antsy, so let's start. Okay, so um, I know I said this last week, um, but I think this is the week that it really starts getting interesting. We got we get to start working with more interesting data sets, something a little bit more cool. Okay, because before we've been working with essentially Excel spreadsheets, which are not as fun. Um, Deep learning is about doing uh, cool looking deep stuff. Um, that's where a lot of my enjoyment comes out of it. So now we're actually gonna do something kind of cool. Uh, something you can visualize a little bit better. So just like the week before, we're gonna dive right into the questions or the question. Actually, sorry, we're gonna go over what we're going through. So we're working on neural networks again. We're continuing on that. We're gonna dive a little bit more deep. We're gonna look a little bit more into how uh, Python will treat neural networks and how um, mathematically it's treated. It's, it's a little bit different than conceptually. The mathematical uh, background behind it is, is different. We're going to go over a new, a new loss. We've been using mean squared error for week one and week two. Now we're working in, a, in something called classification. So we're going to use different types of classification loss. And specifically, the one we're going to be using is called cross entropy loss. Number three, mini batching. Uh, mini batching uh, can be a little bit of a weird concept, but it'll help your code run a little bit faster and you guys will get used to it conceptually. Uh, and then saving and loading model state, very, very important. Okay, so the question, the problem, can, I'm continuing to add some University of Guelph flair to it, okay? So this week, the University of Guelph runs a yearly square dancing competition where contestants send in videos of their choreography and agriculture department professors rate their moves on a scale of zero to nine, zero being the worst and nine being a perfect score. Due to poor planning, the university used paper and pen to record their scores. Uh oh. And they're having trouble digitizing their results. They have asked Brain Tank to take these written scores and label them correctly. We are hoping to be 95% correct in our classification. Okay, so there's a problem. Let's go over a little bit about what it means. Let's put some visual aid to it. So the data set, what we're looking at, we have 7D thousand, so a lot of scores, um, handwritten images, okay? They come in the form of 28 pixels by 28 pixels. The images are in grayscale. Okay, it's a lot of students, it really is, it really is. This is a, a renowned worldwide competition. Um, <laughs> we have a training set of 60,000 and a test set of 10,000. We're, so we're splitting it apart and just review from last week. Remember our training set is like the textbook. It's what we study on. It is how our model learns the intricacies of the data and the test set we will use after to validate our results and make sure that our model is actually learning how to classify numbers instead of memorizing the textbook. Okay. All images have an associated label with them. 
labels are integers of values zero to nine, which makes sense because we have different numbers zero to nine. So for example, bottom left, we have the pixel values that looks like a shape five, that looks like a five to me. And it has a label associated with them saying that that is a five, okay? So our job right here, remember deep learning is all about translation of information, transformation of information. Uh, our job is to transform this pixel data right here and create an accurate prediction of what the model thinks it is. So if we have a good performing model, this will predict it's a five. If we have a bad uh, performing model, maybe they'll think it's a one or a two, okay? That is what we're going at. Looking at the data set a little bit, and I want to get us a little bit more familiar with um, the term tensors and tensor shape, is a three-dimensional array with the shape of 1, 28, and 28. Uh, we're going to expand upon that a little bit later, but I want you to read it like this. We have one color dimension, so it's black and white. If we had a color numbers, which unfortunately we do not, it would be uh, 3, 28, 28, because there's a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. But since it's black and white, we have one color dimension. Uh, the image is 28 pixels high and 28 pixels wide. So that's how we can transform a picture into something that Python can look at, a tensor of three dimensions. Perfect. Uh, white pixel values in images typically have the value of 256. So the whitest of white pixels will be labeled 256. The blackest of black pixels will have a value of zero and gray pixels will obviously have an intermediate value. So if we're pointing arrows, we can see white pixel right here, 256. Black pixels, the background, uh, zero. And then this pixel right here is an intermediate value and it's, it should be around 100, probably in the middle between zero and 256. Okay, now if you were paying attention to last week, which I know all of you were, we can have an issue with this. Specifically last week, we talked about normalization and trying to put our input data in a smaller range. So you, you want your maximum value to be no more than five and your minimal value to be more, no less than negative five or something like that, around those ranges. You wanna keep them small for sure. And right now we'd be inputting values of 256. So that's a problem. So PyTorch for us, and when we get our hands on, we'll, we'll see, it's going to have some functionality to normalize the data for us. So what's happening is, is this is the actual pixel values of an, of an image. If you look really closely, if you follow my cursor, you can see there's a seven, a little bit of a squash seven, looks a little bit like a seven. So 2.81 is associated to a value very high, of like 255, that's the whitest of white pixels and negative 0 0.4 is, is black. Uh, the numbers may look a little bit weird. I know before we talked about uh, scaling between the numbers zero and one, you want all values squished in between there. You can expand on that a little bit. This is using um, a technique uh, popular in statistics. It's using uh, standard deviation and mean values. And it basically, it creates a, a, a normalcy curve. And all you have to know is it keeps it in within range. Okay, I'm gonna let Christopher in, I think he has some issues. Okay, so that's how we're normalizing our data. So we, one of the checklists we wanna make sure before passing any data into our models to make sure it's normalized. Just as a preface, we got that done, perfect. Okay, so how are we actually going to tackle this problem? Put that up here. Um, we see, we have a grid of pixels on the left and we can see that this is a six. What we want to do is we want to make this neural metable. And that is a word I have invented right now. Um, neural networks are very good at passing in. You pass in vectors. So that's like a one-dimensional array. That's like a big array of um, mixed size. Our model, we want to take in 784 pixels. And that is because our image is of size 28 by 28. 28 times 28, we have 784 pixels. So every single pixel in this grid has its own input node, right? We've worked with neural networks in the past. I hope we're, we're remembering a little bit about neural network nodes. Um, every single pixel has one associated to it. So the first pixel is the top left up here. Second pixel is right here. And it keeps on going, it keeps on going. So maybe this one is about pixel 500 and that would be inputting a value of around 2.8, a very high value, okay? Now, output, just as important as output, what we want out of it, 
it will be a percent likelihood that that image belongs to each class. And that's a little bit confusing if I'm just speaking it, but um, showing some examples, you're gonna, you guys are gonna catch on very fast. So our model, if it is doing well, this is a trained model, for example, it'll take all this pixel images and it'll give you percent likelihoods, okay? So if we see next to this six, our model is basically telling us right now, there is a 97% chance that this image is a six. Um, it also has a little bit of a circular nature. It's a little bit curvy and all that stuff. So maybe it thinks a very small chance it's a zero, 0 0.1, but it's, it's very, very confident it's, it's a six. Um, it might be a little bit like an eight, eights and sixes look a little bit similar. So maybe it's a small prediction, but essentially this trained model is saying, this is a six, I'm pretty confident on it. Um, and it definitely is not a seven. It's definitely not a five. It's not a four. It's not three. You have zero percent chances of those. Okay. So our model, what we're going to try to do is create accurate predictions. Awesome. So let's get deeper with neural networks. Hope you guys see what I did there. A little bit of a pun. Awesome. So this is what you guys are used to. You guys have seen this before yesterday. A little bit of a review. You have your parameters in red your three weight uh, values for each input going in. So every neuron, if it has three inputs going in, it'll have three weight values associated with that. It will have a singular bias value, no matter how many inputs, no matter how many outputs the neuron is producing, it'll always have one bias. And the formula to create an output looks like like this. We've been over this, this is the example we did before. You multiply the input by its uh, associated weight. So five times one, 0 0.2 times 0 0.5, negative three times negative 0.75. Uh, you multiply those all up together. You add them together and then add the bias at the end. You'll get a number, you put it through your activation and you'll get a, a number associated with this or, or non-linearity. Uh, we've gone over this in, in some detail. I'm not gonna uh, elaborate on it on too much. Um, awesome. We've also saw that in our previous examples, if one neuron is strong, uh, many are stronger. So we like to create these nets, these waves with hidden layers. We like to think as neural, neural networks as layers. We have our input layer, the data we're putting in, um, the output layer, which is what we're trying to get out of it, um, and a bunch of hidden layers on the inside, which is the brains of the operation. It'll calculate um, different facets. It, it, it'll be the brains to help you calculate what the output is from the input. Perfect. Okay. Um, and it, each neuron follows the same properties that we went through before. You have a certain amount of inputs and when you output them out, you can output them directly to the next layer. Perfect. Okay. So using PyTorch to define models, this is what we did yesterday. If you remember, or sorry, last week, this is what we did last time. We took 24 diamond values about clarity, sharpness, weights, carrots, um, fed it through a neural network with these dimensions and outputted a single value. And that value was associated with a value. It predicted how much the diamond would cost. So a neural network had five layers, 24 inputs, a hidden dimension of a thousand, then a hidden dimension of 500, and then a hidden dimension of 200. And that all led to a singular output. Um, the one thing I want you to notice is notice how PyTorch focuses on layers of neural networks instead of neurons itself. You don't really have to touch a single neuron, you'll treat them all as layers. Uh, we will be investigating why this is by creating our own version of the torch function, torch.nn.linear. So this is what we did last time. This is our linear layer. If you, if you pass in a vector, and when I mean vector, I mean an array, uh, you can use them in, in, in the same term, of 500 values, it'll perform a neural network operation and it'll create a vector of 200 layers. Perfect, and those are all trainable. We're gonna be doing the exact same thing. So looking at this graph, I know when I first learned about neural networks and you see the term network, you see the term um, like connections and links and nodes. If you've ever taken a um, data structures course before, you might be thinking, okay, yes, this is a link list, obviously. Um, but that is actually not the case. We treat it very, very differently. And it, it was a little misleading to me. It's, it's a little bit of a, reversal of expectations for sure. Um, so we're actually gonna go over what exactly happens in the background. So let's use this network as an example. This network has five inputs and three outputs. Before we start doing some of the math, I wanna preface this so you guys aren't freaked out. 
Um, when teaching this, we are going to be doing some concepts that involve some linear algebra. If you're in first year, you should be taking linear algebra now. Eric can confirm. Ooh, Eric can confirm that for me. Um, so you should be a little bit familiar with matrix multiplication. It doesn't come intuitively all, uh, to everybody. If you don't understand 100% about what's happening, uh, that's okay. I'm not gonna make you write down formulas or do any tests. I just want you to have an intuitive in understanding of what's happening behind the scenes, okay? And how modern deep learning nets actually work behind the scenes. So this network has five input and three output layers. If we were using torch.nn.linear, it would look a lot like this. We would have five input and three outputs. Um, so our goal is basically to transform a vector or array of five numbers. It goes through a neural network implementation and outputs a vector of three numbers. Five, three. I'm sure you're all following. <laughs> so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set a matrix. We're creating a matrix. Our matrix will have three output nodes. So we're gonna make it three tall and it'll have five input nodes. So we're gonna make it five wide. Perfect. Um, in mathematical terms, you would say this is a matrix belonging to real numbers because the numbers we're gonna put into it are uh, real numbers, which is uh, essentially decimal numbers, if you wanna think of it that way. Um, and it has the dimension of three by five. So you might be wondering why we're creating a matrix. What does it have anything to do with the neural network? What we can do is we can look at, let's say we look at this node right now, the first one. We can see that each line in this graph should have an associated weight. So this node feeding into these three output nodes, they'll all have weights and we can label them like this. Weight one, one, weight two, one, weight three, one. And those are all just regular numbers. They're parameters. Remember parameters are always in red. I'll always outline them as red in this, uh, in these lecture series. Um, and the first letter, I don't know if you can see in the bottom left. I hope you can, it's a little small. Um, the first number is the output node number and the second number is the input node number. So W21 is the weight that connects this node with the first node right here. Perfect. We can do that for the second node, generate some weights. Now we have weight one, two, weight two, two, weight three, two. So we're basically, all we're doing is defining um, weights in a grid, um, seemingly arbitrarily, but they have special properties. The way we're laying it out, you'll see why, okay? Right now, our job, remember, is to transform a vector with a bunch of real numbers in it into a vector that's three big. So five to a vector of three. Um, and if you guys know some uh, matrix multiplication and some linear algebra stuff, you might know where I'm going, but we are gonna bring out, first of all, a transpose operation. Um, that'll basically keep the same numbers, but flip them around. So now instead of having a three by five, we have a five by three. And you'll see why we do that. Because when we multiply, we are gonna get an array that is uh, a length of three. So if you remember matrix multiplication, uh, you have to make sure that this number and this number are the same when you multiply them and then you keep the other dimensions. So this is a one by three, or this, if it's a vector, you can just call it of length three. Um, so perfect. We're doing some matrix multiplication and let's step through what that looks like. So first of all, the first value is gonna be all of these values together. And if we remember our matrix multiplication, we uh, take this vector and this row and pairwise we multiply them. So input one times weight one, one, input two times weight one, two, input three times weight one, three, input four times weight one, four, and finally input five times weight one, five. This should look familiar. I'm sure you guys know where I'm going at because you get a formula that looks a lot like this. Okay, this is exactly what it is. And that should remind you of this. What we were doing is we were taking all of the input nodes and by doing a matrix multiplication, which sounds like it has nothing to do with neural networks, it actually is the exact same thing. We're taking inputs, multiplying them by their weights. Input, weight, input, weight. Let's go back, let's look at it. Input one times weight. Input two times associated weight. Blah, 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 you're there. Now, if you have a keen eye, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are seeing this, we're missing one thing, a crucial, crucial step. Fortunately, it's implemented very easily. And that is our bias, oh, which we are talking about later. <laughs> um, first of all, let's go through the other um, multiplications. So it's the exact same thing. 
we take this vector and we multiply it by now the second column. You get input one times weight to one and la da 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 all the way to the end. Um, if you see in our graph down here, all of these weights, you can see the red arrows right here. Those are the associated weights. So output two, this is the second row. Output two, you are getting inputs and uh, weights from all of these inputs. Perfect. You do that again, same thing. And now we can see it is implemented following um, the neural network structure. Now, this is what I was getting at. Now, what are we missing from this formula? Of course, we are missing the bias, which is easily implemented by just adding a bias at the end of uh, vector three. So we'll have bias one, two, and three. And now our final formula looks like this, which is exactly how we implemented our neural networks before. Okay. So if you are a linear algebra nerd, or if you just enjoy linear algebra taking classes, you can get a lot of information from this. Understanding this is a real life application of linear algebra. Um, you might find this insightful and interesting. If you are not immediately perfect at working with linear algebra, I want you to just understand how these numbers are calculated together and why we're doing it. And below the surface, if you look under the hood, this is a little bit of a peek about what's actually happening. Okay. So take different information from this. Uh, corresponding with where you are right now. Great. So in summary, if you're really a linear algebra nerd, this is what the equation looks like. It should look familiar again, especially from week one. Y equals mx plus b. Very similar. We're extending, we're expanding upon it. This is a more uh, com or, or, or a difficult linear combination is what you call it. So basically, instead of y equals mx plus b, you have a lot more components in there. Great. Awesome. So why do we do matrix multiplication? First of all, number one reason by far is denounces all other reasons. It's fast. It's a lot faster. So if you try to make a linked list with all the nodes together and put a weight in between all of their connections and la di da di da and figure that out, uh, the computer would have to point at different nodes and it would take a long time to get through. This computers are excellent at matrix multiplication. That's one of the things that they're, they're, they're great at. You can scale it up quite high. It's how you can get billions and billions of parameters in the most interesting models. Um, it's easily differentiable, which in, um, if you take more deep learning courses in the future will be more important than you are now when you get into the calculus. Um, right now, we're not gonna worry about that, but that is important. That's also very important. It's easily differentiable, uh, which is a calculus term if you know what differentiable is. Um, and it produces the same results as if you use like this. So it's a cleaner, more elegant solution. It's faster, it's better. It's what's gonna drive deep learning in the future, okay? So before we had this network produces five outputs and three, uh, sorry, five inputs and five and three outputs. We are instead of using the torch library, torch.nn.linear, uh, input five, output three, we are gonna create our own, okay? And we're gonna get that to that very soon. Custom net layer, five, three, perfect. Okay, now one other thing that I wanna talk about. I talked a little bit in the past about uh, PyTorch and how PyTorch has a lot of what are called tensor features, which are like arrays essentially. Um, so a matrix is a tensor, a vector is a type of tensor. Um, matrices are two dimensional, vectors are one dimensional. Tensors are, is just a word for any of them. So three-dimensional, five-dimensional, six-dimensional, you can have tensors that are hundred dimensional if you want. Um, but PyTorch and um, linear algebra go very hand in hand. Um, PyTorch is essentially a linear algebra library with some pretty cool um, neural network stuff in the background. So that's gonna make it very easy, very elegant for us to add, like multiply these matrices together and add bias and define parameters in these matrices. Um, it's gonna make it very easy for us. We're just gonna come in handy when we actually start coding. Awesome. So classification loss, this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so we had the same loss each time we use mean squared error. We're gonna dive into a little bit of a different one because we are tackling a completely different issue than we were before. Classification loss. So week one and two, the questions were, given a cow's weight, what number should the cow's cost be? Given information about a diamond, what number should the diamond's value be? And that is from week two. Um, so how we approach the loss, we did a model prediction versus ground truth. We're gonna do that again today, but in a different way. 
we needed to make the model's prediction as close to the ground truth as possible. So we used something called mean squared error. So essentially we had a price value for the cow and our predicted price value, and we wanted them to be as close as possible. That would indicate a good connection, a great prediction from our model. Um, if it was very far apart, the mean squared error would penalize that and try to force it to be as close as possible. Now we wanna do something similar. We want our ground truth and our prediction to be similar, but we're working with a different type of data. And we're gonna dive into that. So the question is given a list of pixels, which numbers do those pixels correlate to? So uh, the model will output 10 different numbers correlating to the likelihood it believes the picture uh, to belong to a certain classification. Uh, it's easier to visualize. We're gonna, I'm gonna bring up that visualization again. And we need to compare that to the image's actual labels. So if you remember before, this one I'm talking about, the model is instead of outputting a singular number and we would want our prediction and our ground truth numbers to be the same, we're gonna output a bunch of numbers. We're gonna input, output a vector of numbers and specifically our vector is gonna be 10 long. And it is gonna be our likelihood that six or this, these images pixels belong to six or to zero or to one. Um, so one thing I wanna go over that's important is how did we get our predictions to magically be percents? So if you add up every single number in here, number in here, it's always gonna add up to one. No matter how trained or untrained the model is, it will always be a percent chance. How do we do that? And we are gonna implement something called soft max loss. So models, as you know, can produce a large range of numbers. The soft max function will transform those values into percentages. Um, they're not quite percentages of value. They have a little bit to do with uh, exponentials. So if you, even if you're a little bit ahead of the rest, you'll take a higher percentage of that cake. Um, don't have to worry about it too much. They will always all add up to one. And this is how we'll evaluate what class the image belongs to. So if we're reading this, we have an output layer of 1.3, 5.1, 2.2, .2, 0 0.7, and 1.1. What will happen is the, the highest values will get a higher percentage label. So for this case, our um, classification, if, if we're just predicting, let's say five numbers, our classification of class number two will be the highest. We'll say it's 90% class two. Um, the lowest will be class four. We'll say it's only 1% class four, okay? So there's a little bit of winner takes all identity here. If you're ahead, you'll get more percentage, but you don't have to worry too much about that, okay? So that's important, percentage. Awesome. So what we have to do is our output will create softmax outputs. So you're familiar with this, our 97% chance. And what we're going to compare that to, instead of comparing that to a single number like we did before, our cow cost. So for example, a cow that's worth $1,000 would get compared to the prediction. We are going to compare it to element-wise ground truths. Okay. So this is the number six. Our label says it's the number six. Our job is to try to predict the number six. So the sixth class, so starting from zero, this is a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're comparing the likelihood vector to the ground truth likelihood vector. And what this is saying is that this is 100% a six. I know it's a six, it's given knowledge. It is a six and it's not anything else. So what we're gonna try to do is get our model prediction to be as close to this ground truth as possible. You should be very familiar with that because that's what we've been doing all these weeks and it's gonna be what we're doing until the end. Awesome. So let's look at some cross entropy loss examples. So that the loss is how we're gonna uh, measure the difference between the predictions and the ground truths, okay? So this image right here correlates with the number two. I'm sure you guys have been able to read numbers for probably since kindergarten. So you guys are experts at that. Um, we can also see that the model has done a very poor job of classifying it. So the ground truth, it says it's 100% a two, while our model is maximum, is at a maximum state of entropy, which is, I know a chemistry term, you might've heard it in astronomics, but it means it has very low information. It is um, doing bad, essentially. It is predicting everything to be 10%. So it's like, there's a 10% chance it's a zero. There's a 10% chance it's a two. There's a 10% chance it's a seven. It has no idea. There's no information gain. If someone gives you this vector right here, 
you don't know anything about the pixel data correlated with it, okay? As we get smarter, or oh, actually, as we can see, if you pass that into the cross entropy loss function, it'll output a number. And that number in this case will be 2.3446. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, we did quite a terrible, terrible, terrible job, um, but we can get better. And when we do get better, for example, with this, the model is still predicting a two, but it's better. Now it's a 46% chance it's a two. Um, it only thinks it's a 5% chance it's an eight, a 9% chance it's, or 5% chance it's a nine, 4% chance it's a five, 12% chance it's a zero. Maybe it looks a little bit like a zero. It's a little curvy like a zero. Maybe it thinks it's a one. Ones and twos can look similar, especially if you like adding the tails to your ones. I don't know, whatever. Um, but it's better for sure. And you can see that's reflected in the loss, where before our loss was 2.3446. Just like in the previous example, our model is getting better and our loss is getting lower. We want to lower the loss. And when we get something that's pretty perfect, for example, this one right here, it says it's a 99% chance it's a two. It's very, very smart. The model knows what's going on. Um, the loss is very, very low, very minimal. So the same idea, okay? So now you might be asking, what exactly is this cross entropy loss? Okay, cross, the cross entropy loss function is quite involved and it is tough to understand. Cross, so cross entropy loss will be provided to you when coding. We wanna teach you how to work with it and not really understand the backbones behind it necessarily. It has a lot to do with information theory. So entropy, uh, if, I know we talked about this in physics before, you might hear about the universe being in entropy. It means that everything is mixed together and there's not a lot of information, but once you start um, finding patterns in that. So uh, instead of being a goop, if you separate the particles together, you might get a higher amount of information gain. If you've ever heard of those concepts before, it's the same idea. Um, and that's what makes it so complicated. Entropy is a very complicated topic, so we're not going to go super into it. Um, however, and this is the most important part by far, is it shares properties with previous loss functions that you're comfortable with. And the properties that matter the most by far are um, a more incorrect algorithm will create a high level of loss on average. A more correct algorithm will create a low level of loss on average. And the optimizer's job is to minimize the loss. You should also understand the purpose of cross entropy loss, namely in classification problems. So in this case, we're classifying pixel data to um, a bunch of labels from zero to nine. You'll see a lot of different applications before. If you want to do, for example, face recognition for your phone, uh, what you can do is try to classify this as, is this Nick? Is this Nick's mom? Is this someone else? And those are other types of classification problems. Um, in the future, we'll look at pictures of like dogs and cats and trying to see if it's a picture of a dog or a picture of a cat. Same type of problems, classification problems. It's a, it's a type of uh, machine learning issue. Okay, mini batching. So mini batching, I'm sure might come out as a little bit in, unintuitive to you guys. Um, might be a little bit confusing as to why you're doing this, but it's, it's really simple. There's not a lot to it once you really get used to it. So before the deep learning flow, you have seen this before uh, 100%. I'm sure you guys remember it and I'm sure you guys are probably sick of it. Um, before, and what I want, really want you to, to uh, take a grasp of is, is this bolded part. Uh, we would initialize our model randomly and give parameters random values, uh, used to that. Um, but the thing that we did before is we grabbed a single entry from the data set and input in a ground truth associated with that input. We are going to change the deep learning flow to be the new deep learning flow. Instead of grabbing one entry, so a input and an output, and we're trying to predict the output, we are gonna grab a mini batch of data from the data set, a few inputs and their associated ground truth with those inputs. So we are instead gonna take a chunk, um, the same amount each time when we grab it. Typically you'll grab 32 labels. You can grab five different sets of data. Uh, you can change them. It's called a mini batch size. In this case, we're gonna grab um, three and you'll see in the, um, the test, you'll, uh, you'll see it a little bit more visual on the next slide. This is what, essentially what we do. Before, so we were grabbing one diamond and their one input feature. We put that through the model, create one result, associate that with one ground truth, create one loss, pass that to the optimizer. 
Now what we are doing is instead we're going to grab three of them and pass three input features through the model at the same time, create three different outputs. So if you notice, and an important thing about this is that all of these inputs, so the input from the first diamond uh, will create a unique output. The input from the second diamond will create a unique output as well. And essentially the, the different inputs, they don't touch each other. They don't influence each other in any way. It's as if you pass through this, got a number, put it in a list, pass through the second diamond, uh, got an output, put it in a list, passed in the third diamond, got an output, put it in the list. It, they're independent of each other. Um, one diamond will not affect another one. Uh, you're just doing it at the same time, essentially. You will create three results, uh, compare that to their associated ground truth values. You will create three different losses. And then the important part is you average those losses together and pass that to the optimizer. Okay. This is a very fundamental deep learning technology. It's a little unintuitive, but I, I did want to add it to the presentation. I was um, debating as if I wanted to teach you guys this concept because it seems so redundant and so strange uh, why you're doing it multiple times at one input, but it is universally used. You will not find a deep learning paper essentially where they don't mini batch. Uh, so getting used to you, uh, you guys working in the real world, I think we gotta do some real world stuff. Okay, so why do we do this? Um, easy, easy, easy. There's one answer, it just makes training faster. Um, so instead of taking each individual entry and implementing them and finding it and then finding the differential and calculating and giving it to the optimizer, blah, 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 on each thing, if you do it on let's say 32 or 10, a batch size of 10, if you take 10 at the same time and then average their losses together, you will get similar data, you'll get similar learning, um, but it'll go by a little bit faster. Um, so the same data is inputted and each piece of data in the batch is independent from the other pieces of data. So that's what I'm talking about before. They don't touch each other. Uh, as a result, the model will still learn the same way. However, instead of, instead of calculating loss and optimizing on each piece of data, it does it in bunches, speeding up the process. So um, yeah, it's essentially what it is. The standard length of a for a batch, I see typically used is around 32, but it does change quite a bit depending on factors. When we're coding, we're gonna be using a batch size of nine. And I just did that for visualization reasons, you'll see why. But um, there is like a happy medium. You usually wanna find around batch size of 32, but it, it won't make too big of a difference if you go more or less, okay? So the last topic, this is a PyTorch topic, saving and loading the model. Um, now that we're working with more complicated data, more complicated models, uh, like compare that to the linear regression we did in week one, this is a lot more involved, a lot more complicated. There's a lot more parameters, more numbers, more outputs, more data. The data is the bigger sizes. Uh, it's gonna take a lot longer to train and you shouldn't be too surprised by that. Um, so something that's valuable is training once and testing multiple times. So you can train a, a, a model once Maybe it'll take an hour to do, maybe it'll take 10 minutes. It depends what you're training. Um, saving your model, and then you can reuse it in the future. So PyTorch makes it really, really easy. Um, the save functionality, torch.save, you save what is called the model state dict, which is, stands for state dictionary. And it is essentially a dictionary, which is a data structure that has all of the weights, all the parameters. It'll keep it out, them out for you. Um, later, you can initialize a model and load those dates back or the, that um, state dict from a file that you save on your computer and put it directly into the model. PyTorch makes this very, very easy. Um, so I only need one slide to explain it. How amazing is that? Saving me some time. Okay, deep learning flow. I'm going to go over this very quickly. We've been over this before. So our model is going to look like this. And I want you guys to be a little bit more use to the vector and tensor um, format. So what you're looking here at input features, where's my mouse here is, um, we have an, an input of 12828. That is the size. So don't be, don't be thinking this is a, a vector with values 128 and 28. It, the, when I use these smooth brackets like this, I'm gonna be talking about size. So we will have an image label, which is associated with nine, um, and an input feature. This is an image. So remember, we have one black channel, 
um, 28 pixels high and 28 pixels wide. What we're gonna be doing is using a batch of three for this example. So mini batch size is three. We'll be using nine when we actually start coding. Um, what we do, we bunch all this data together and we create um, a input of three by 748. So we take those pixel data for each pixel, we string it out. We make it one dimensional. We basically just, if, if the images data are stacked on top of each other, we just take a pixel row and put it next to each other and build one mega long chain of pixels um, because that is easy to put into a neural network. Uh, we will do that for each image in our batch. So we are going to input into our model a, a chunk of data, a matrix that is three by 748. So we have, I want you to read it like in English and not reading it like in math. You, I have three images with 748 pixels each, okay? Our model will output, again in English, it'll have three predictions of 10 classes. So we take those predictions and remember our predictions look like this. Um, they're percentage hoods. Uh, and we're gonna compare that to ground truth. So we're gonna compare the prediction for uh, input or image one with a um, vector that is associated to the number nine. And we're going to do that with the rest of these. So image two and uh, a vector associated with six, uh, image three and a vector associated with zero, because that is what our classification is. We're, we're inputting an image of the shape zero, uh, six, and nine. Compare that, pass that to cross entropy loss, uh, not getting into the details of cross entropy loss. They will give out a decision. And as we train, uh, we're going to get better and better. So we start off with losses of 0 0.356, 0 0.564, and 0 0.785. We average those together. That's what we do with batching. We average the losses together, um, pass it to the optimizer, and the optimizer will change the parameters in our neural network. We will have a lot of parameters in this one because we are using such a big neural network. Um, it'll optimize those, bam, and then we will go on to getting the other batch. So now we have a batch of image four, image five, and image six, and those are associated with four, nine, and one. Um, our losses are a lot smaller now, so we're getting smarter and smarter. We pass it to the optimizer, blah, blah, blah. You guys are used to this. Um, the deep, the new deep learning flow, now with batches, is universal. So we have been that. Okay, awesome, that's done. Now to the fun part. Okay, same thing as before, we are gonna start coding, okay? So get your computer out. I hope it's okay. I know it can be a little tricky, especially for the Zoom people um, who have to watch the presentation and code at the same time. I hope maybe you have double screens or double monitors, or you just find a way to make it work. Um, but we are gonna go to, again to github.com slash brain tank deep learning. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And now we are on week three, week three, perfect. Okay, <clears throat> so if you're there, a few things I want to point out. Every single GitHub uh, week now has, um, I know people requested it, it has the complete code on it. So if you look in here, this is from week one. Here's week one complete. So this will have the finished code that we wrote together. So we wrote this code together for week one. It produced this results, these results. And now that is on the GitHub. So if you want to cross-reference that, uh, everything is there. The link is in the Instagram as well. Week two, um, it has the completed one as well. So this is what we coded yesterday or last week, my mistake. Last week, this is what we coded and the results are all there. Um, on top of it just being the code, we also have the PDFs. So this, I don't know if it'll show. I don't think it will. I don't think GitHub, it does. Okay, here's the slide. Um, so if you guys want to use that, check it out. Um, it's all there. Everything there. Everything's public. Okay. Back to the important thing. Brain tech deep learning. We are in week. It's going to load and it is week three. So same process. Going to code a code. You're going to download the zip. Okay. Um, Ooh, let me make it a little bit screen sharing. I like the screen. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Now you should be able to see, I downloaded it. Um, I'm gonna 
open that file with Windows Explorer. Awesome. Week three, main. If you extract it or any sort of way, um, I'm going to extract that to my desktop. And drive desktop extract. Awesome. Now I'll have those files on my desktop. Here they are on my desktop. Desktop. I spelled it right this time. Last time I had some issues. <laughs> awesome. So you have it extracted. This is all the information. Uh, Model.state. You have not seen a file like this before. We're going to get to it. That is interesting. And then once again, we're going to go to our friends over at Google Colab. So Google Colab, here it is. Google Colab, sign in. You should be able to recognize this guy right here. Awesome. New notebook, new notebook. Perfecto, perfecto. And then up at the top, file. We are going to upload notebook. And then you're going to take the file that you extracted before. What we want is week3.ipynb. I always trip up on the acronym. I think I nailed it this time. Um, not the complete one. The complete one will have answers on it. Uh, we want to develop this ourselves. Awesome. Okay. If you get a pop-up pop up that says leave page, I think it's only on the Firefox that it happens, but just leave it. It's fine. Okay. Awesome. You guys have seen code that looks a little bit like this before. Um, is everyone good? I'm going to let me get the chat up to see if we have any issues. I think we are fine. I don't see any issues. Please let me know if we do have some issues. Um, it's just me today, so Sarah is not going to be monitoring. Okay, first thing, pull up the, the files. You will see nothing here. We're going to run this code right here. It'll, just like we've done before, it'll get cloned. It'll grab everything from the GitHub. And then if we refresh, week three, right here. Awesome. So now we have all the information we need. Lesson three.pdf week three to IPBYN and then model state. Perfect, perfect. So that is up and running. So I have created some helper functions for us. I'm gonna run through it a little bit. Uh, no need to change them. Uh, get data set. This will be our code to um, grab the image data set. This image data set I stole. It's a pretty famous data set for uh, data scientists. It was made in, I think, the 90s by this guy named Yen Lacan. Um, so it's not actually images from uh, a hoedown. I'm sorry to uh, break the experience and the immersion. Um, but it's called the MNIST data, data set, M-N-I-S-T, developed by this guy named Yen Lacan, who is an absolute legend um, in machine learning. He's one of the guys who penned a lot of uh, the interesting stuff we can do today. And he worked out of U of T, so be proud to be Canadian. Um, printing images, we'll get to that. That is just a nice visualization technique. Creating one hot, we will also get to that. And then here is our softmax loss or our cross entropy loss um, is probably the more apt name. Uh, you can see it's quite, it's quite complicated, quite involved. Um, this does a lot of the functionality for you, but just know it works. It's all we have to care about. Okay. And here is what we are doing today. So our task, number one, create our own neural network layer class. As Laura was talking about before with the matrix multiplication, we are going to be creating our own uh, torch.nn.linear, which is what we did last week. We're going to create our own. Um, helpful formula, the out equals the input vector times A, which is your matrix of length, um, we did three and five, but it's length output times length of input. Uh, and then B is your vector and it's also gonna be length of output, okay? Um, you'll get a hands-on evaluation with that. Uh, the second thing, create a neural network that can predict the label associated with an image's pixel values. Our model would take in a batch of images as input and output vectors and output vectors of length 10 with percent values associated with the likelihood it thinks a picture belongs to its corresponding label. We've been over that. Three, devise a strategy to test our network and see if it's doing a good or bad job at predicting labels. Um, I have a great plan for that. I'm sure you guys are excited. Uh, and then number four, save and load our uh, model to prevent needing to train and retrain the model every time we want to test. Awesome. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, one other thing I wanna uh, talk about is you see at the very bottom, 
I have a bunch of functions ready for you. So this is the train function, the test function. We did this last week. Uh, we have now two networks that we're creating. Okay, so me in the chat. Will our custom layers do anything different than the PyTorch uh, makes for you? Uh, no, they're actually gonna produce the exact same results, essentially. Um, the PyTorch ones are, will be a little bit faster. So I recommend if you're doing anything higher um, to use the PyTorch ones, they're great, they're there for you. They actually have a C++ backbone, so it avoids a lot of this. We're gonna be doing this in pure Python. Um, but great question, great, great question. Okay, um, but no, you'll see, we're gonna get some great results from the using our own, but it's essentially gonna be the exact same thing. Okay, so first thing we want to do, let me get my notes up. Sorry, just give me one second, guys. Awesome, okay. So down here, it says, if name equals da -da -da main, this is PyTorch's wonky way of doing like a main um, function. Like in C, you use the main all the time. Uh, this is how PyTorch does it. So if you see, if we just print hello here and run the code, it'll produce an error because we actually have to run this code up here as well. My mistake. Run this code up top. It won't do anything. You just got to make sure it's run. Um, you also got to give it a second. The first time you run code on uh, Google Colab, it takes some time. Okay, now that we run that, now that we click it, <laughs> awesome, it works. We just print hello. It is just where we're gonna code. Um, it, it helps a little bit of the, the name conflictions that we had last week. Okay, great. First thing we're gonna do, get the data sets. So how we're gonna do that is we're gonna get our train data set and our test data sets. And we were going to get that from a function. And our function is get data sets. And then our get data set takes one parameter and it's called batch size. We are going to use a batch size of nine. Okay. Perfect. 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 Okay. So let's see. I want to just show you guys how big these are. Okay. So um, I'm going to be doing a lot of printing of like size and shape and stuff like that. If you guys don't want to follow along, you guys don't have to print them. You just have to, I'll just show you what the numbers are. Um, so what you'll get, first of all, is it'll download a bunch of images. There is our friend, Yan Lacan. Uh, I talked a little bit about him before. The first time you do it, it'll uh, download all these images. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to run it again just to get rid of the messy things. Okay. So we'll see that our train data set is of size 6,666 and our testing is of size 1,111. Kind of weird. We're supposed to have 70,000 images um, in total and we're supposed to have 60,000 in our training set and um, 1,000 in our test set. So kind of, or 10,000 in our test set. Kind of weird, but what's actually happening is it's putting them in batches. So we have 6,666 batches. If we multiply that by nine, uh, we would get our 70 or 60,000 um, images almost by one, just running error, but it's okay. Don't worry about the running error. Um, so instead, if we ran this with one batch, uh, we'll see that we have our 60,000 training images and our 10,000 testing images. We'll just put them in batches. So we have 6,666 batches of nine images in each batch. And for our testing set, we have 1,111. Very straightforward. Okay, if we actually want to look at some of the data, what we have to do is iterate through it in a loop. Um, so we're going to say for data in train data sets. Awesome. And we're going to print data. So that'll get uh, each row. It'll run this loop 6,666 times, and it's going to print out the data each time. I'm going to break after. Um, that's just so it doesn't print out 6,666 things. It'll print it out once, it'll print this out, and then it'll exit. Cool. So this is what we get. Remember how there's a lot of negative 0.4s? Those are our black pixels. You, can, you can't see all the pixels. It's a little bit tough because they squish it all together. But these are all of the black pixels. There sh will be higher ones. This is not a great way to visualize images. Um, but this is what the actual matrices look like. Okay, then you can see that they are normalized. A better way to visualize is what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna get image 
equals data zero, you can actually see that this big thing is an array and the array has two things in it. It has the image data at index zero and it has the label data at index one. So image and then label, we're actually do labels and images because I want you guys to get used to the fact that we're working in batches. So data one, awesome. So first thing, print images dot shape. Shape will give you the dimensionality of the matrix. Okay, next print labels dot shape. And I'm also gonna print labels just to help us visualize. Okay, so we run this code. We don't wanna print data anymore. That's a shame. Awesome. So here, here it is. Our images look like this. They have a shape 9, 1, 28, 28. Now, do you guys understand what that means? It means we have nine images in our batch. Each image has a color dimension of one. It is black and white. And it is a 28 by 28 image. That's why it's looking like this. So if you look at the first image of index zero, you will see... Uh, a one by 28 by 28 matrix. And that'll have all the pixel data in it for you. Perfect, that's exactly what we're looking for. Our label shape is a little different. It's just a vector of size nine. It'll have nine incident, okay? And what those correlate to is our ground truth values. So we have nine images. The first image will be of a five. The second image will be of a zero. The third image will be of a four, okay? So let's make this a little bit more obvious. And you'll see why I did um, I did uh, batch size of nine. So print image is a function that I made. It's one of our helpers, print image. We're gonna pass in images, not too difficult to understand. And then our target is gonna be our labels, okay? We can get rid of these and we can really see what's going on behind the curtains. Run this, takes a while, takes a while, but it creates this pretty graphic for us. Okay, we can see that the, this is a pixel value for five. This is what our image looks like. And it has a target of five, our label. This is what we're trying to predict. So zero, zero, four, four, two, two, nine, nine, three, three, one, 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 one. Okay, very straightforward. Uh, that is what our data looks like. And that is what we're gonna try to accomplish with our data. Okay, um, so take a second, you can look at that. Um, okay, so now we're going to take a little bit of a step back from this. We are going to comment this out. So a good way to comment is you do three uh, single quotation marks in between. I'm just going to save that for later. We, we don't need it. What we're going to start on is our neural network layer. Okay, so we have a class called a neural network layer. This is our torch.nn.linear from last time, but we're gonna make it our own. So nn layer equals, remember the class name, which is neural network layer, neural network layer. And this neural network layer is for the first model we're ever gonna use that has parameters. So if you see at the very top, self is always there. You can ignore it, self is just crucial. Um, but anyone's after these, these are your parameters. So we have to define a number of input layers and a number of output layers. And those are both gonna be integers. So let's use our example from class. If we run this by itself, it'll error because you need to put input layers and output layers. So you have to define beforehand. So just like torch.nn uh, dot linear, let's use our example five and three. Love it. Um, we're gonna input a layer of nodes that has five inputs and three outputs. We run that, we have no issue. Okay, so remember this in this part in our initialization, that is where we put our parameters. Um, so what do our parameters look like in this case? And in this we used our matrix and our vector calculations. Those are our parameters, those were in our red. If you remember, they look a lot like this, okay? 
in the red, those are our parameters. We had a matrix of size five by three, or actually it was three by five, we transposed it, um, and a vector of size three, okay? So let's start implementing that. So our, what we're gonna call our A, which is just like in our formula here, this is our matrix, capital A, capitals are usually saved for matrices. Um, we're gonna set that as a torch vector dot empty. And then we're going to give it a size and the size is going to be equal to you have to put in brackets here another pair of brackets um output layers by input layers okay so it looks like this be careful you have to put this in brackets okay it is called a um it's essentially like a torch list if you put stuff in brackets by itself. Um, but it is very easy to confuse for um, a function call, which it is not. Okay, so we are creating an empty, which means uninitialized matrix of size uh, three by size five. Okay, we're going to make a vector as well. Self dot B equals, same thing, torch dot empty, uninitialized vector size equals, now in brackets, don't forget the brackets, it's gonna be output layers, and then a comma and a space and nothing, okay? The comma and the space are important. If you don't get them, you will get an error, okay? So let's print out self.a.size. You print out self.b.size. And I'm also just gonna print out self.a, Print out self dot b. Okay, let's see what we get. So we're initializing it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, self dot a dot. Oh, not size. Sorry, shape, 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 shape. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So we have worked to plan. We have a matrix of size three by five, which is exactly what we're doing in here. Um, we have a vector of size three which is exactly like our bias and we printed out the values inside them now notice in these values they are very very wonky because this is an uninitialized piece of memory if you're used to c they essentially just set an array but didn't put any values in it and so you get wildly crazy values this is like zero or zero point and then 41 zeros and then three zero eight like it's completely random um so they're uninitialized so we want to fix that so how we do that is very straightforward in Torch. We're just gonna do self.a equals, and we're gonna use a function called torch dot rand, like random n underscore like. That's a function and we're gonna pass in self.a. We're gonna do the exact same thing with self.b. Self.b. B. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, and let's see how that affects our information. I'm gonna take this copy and paste and just copy and paste it once again, just to see how that changes everything we did. Okay, let's run it. And we did. Okay, so when we initialized it, we got uh, our size like this, three and five, vector size three for B. Uh, here are uninitialized values. They're random, they're different again. Um, okay. So when we did torch.rand like, what is happening is it, uh, there's a couple parts to it. Like means that it takes in a matrix or a vector as defined before, it keeps its shape and then initializes the values inside with uh, random normal values, okay? So let's see how that works in practice. It basically created the exact same vector shape, or, right? These are the exact same. Uh, three by five and then three, um, but the values are now normalized. So these are good for our use. Um, they don't get very high outside of two or three, like our lowest value is negative two. Our highest value looks like to be 0 0.7. There's a very random nature to it, or no, our highest value is 1.4. Um, there's a random nature to it. They follow a normal distribution, uh, but they're ready for us to go. So one of the things we have to make sure is that all of our parameters are normalized. That's what ram.n.like did, or underscore like. Um, 
Perfect. Okay, we can get rid of all of these. The last thing we have to do, if you remember from week one, is we have to tell uh, the model that these are parameters. Very, very easy to do. Self.a equals torch dot nn dot capital P parameter. And we're going to put in self.a into that. Okay. B equals torch dot nn dot parameter self dot b. Awesome. We have everything in our arsenal now to do a forward propagation step. So forward propagation is where the word forward comes from. It means uh, put, inputting input uh, vectors and getting an output vector. We have everything we need. We have our A and our B, okay? So let's look at our forward propagation, what it should look like. This is our formula right here. Right here. Um, input multiplied by, and that's a matrix multiplication, by the transposed A plus B. So let's take our image. So our forward propagation, we're gonna get an input activation or input vector. Let's print its shape, okay? Awesome. So now, if we actually wanna test that out, we have to input something to the layer. So we're gonna give a test input. And our test input is just gonna be torch.zeros, or we'll do torch.ones. That's I think a little bit better. And then the size is gonna be very, very straightforward. It's just gonna be uh, input of uh, a vector of input size one. So if we print it out, test underscore input, um, we're just gonna get five number ones, okay? So that's that's just what we're gonna input in. It's just tested in. Uh, we need input for our layer and we're just gonna use that. So what we can do is we can do NN layer. Our input is our test input and let's see what it produces. Awesome, it goes to the top. And immediately what it says is we have an input vector of size five, which is perfect because that's what we outline as our input size, five. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so the first step in our equation, what we wanna do is if you look at the PEMDAS in this equation right now, the first thing we actually have to do is transpose. So transpose doesn't actually have a nice uh, sweet sounding name to fit into BEDMAS or PEMDAS or whatever you, you use in the past. However, um, it takes uh, president, presence. So the first thing we're gonna do is I want us to inverse it. So we do that by doing A, we're gonna create a new variable called A transposed equals torch dot transpose. And then we're gonna transpose self dot A. Now we also have to do the dimensions of transposition, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, just to visualize, I'll print this out for you. So self.a dot shape. Awesome. And then I am going to print out a dot transpose dot shape. You guys don't have to do this every time. If you just look at the screen and understand, that's perfect. Okay, so what it does is we just transpose. Just like in our uh, example before, what we did is uh, it takes quite some time to load, unfortunately, guys. Uh, Okay, we started with a three by five, which is what we have right now. And we flipped it to be a five by three. Perfect. Um, we did the exact same thing. It was a three by five. And now our torch uh, tensor is a five by three. And that is gonna give us our juicy properties that we want to do with um, forward propagation. So perfect. We have transposed perfectly. Exactly what we're looking for. Now we're gonna do some matrix multiplication. So we're gonna create our output activation. Output activation equals, and in Torch, we have a very easy way to multiply matrices, mat and mole. So torch.matrix multiplication. And we're gonna input our input activation. So that is our uh, vector of size five. And we are gonna multiply that with our transposed A. Okay, let's see what it creates. Print out, let's activation, let's see if this works. Okay, we run that. And now we've taken our input, we've multiplied it by our uh, matrix. We've created those interesting properties, um, which has to do with forward propagation. So what we have done, 
So once again, going back to the example, um, we have multiplied them together and we've created this vector here. And this vector is holding all of our um, forward propagation steps. We have multiplied the inputs by the weights uh, associated with them. And we got an output of size three, which is what we're looking for. The one thing we're missing is a bias. So very easily activation equals um, output activation plus self dot B. So now the bias is added. So we run the same code again, same shape. And now we have the same vectors with the bias added onto it. Okay, everything is ready. We can return our return our output activation. And now we have successfully done a forward propagation step uh, using matrix multiplication, just like they would use in torch.nn.layer, okay? So we can print out the values here. We, in, we uh, inputted a bunch of ones and we were outputting a vector of size three. So input of size five, output of size three, just like Torch wants you to do it. Okay. Awesome. That is ready. That is ready for our use. So let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. Don't need that anymore. Now let's focus on the big daddy, the actual score classifier. What we are going to use to train our data set to predict these numbers. Okay. So score classifier. We're, I'm going to call it model. Z is our main model. Equals score classifier. It doesn't take any parameters. There you go. Just that. So this is defining the data set. This is defining the model. Awesome. Now it is time once again to create some parameters for a score classifier. And just like we did last time, we created a bunch of uh, linear components. We're going to do the exact same thing, but we are going to use our own. So what we're going to do is self.nn layer one equals, so that's our first layer, neural network layer. That is the code we just did. We just made a neural network layer. We're going to create one. And our input, our input, we're going to try to input pixel values. And our pixels are 28 by 28. So 28 times 28, that is equal to 784. Um, and it's going to output to 400, OK? Uh, we've done this before, so I'm going to save your time. I'm going to do some quick copying and pasting, some quick editing. OK, perfect. Um, we're going to feed the output of layer one to the input of layer two. So 400, we go to 200, is it 200? It is 200, I have to double check. Um, and then it's gonna go to 200 to 100, um, 100, and then finally to 10. And we've talked about this before. Uh, you can choose different size, especially for the hidden dimensions. You can change, choose any side. I did 400 um, to 200 to 100. You can get varying results with different sizes. Uh, I implore you guys to see how small you can make the model, how big you can make the model, how that affects results. Um, but we're going to use this size because I found great results with it. Um, okay. Now here's where it gets interesting. We are going to do a forward call. Okay. So let's bring back this data we used before because we're going to need images. Okay. So remember our images when we did this, we printed out. Uh, we have our images right here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pass in a batch of images to the model. And how we do that is very easy. We take our model and we put in images. We use images as a parameter. Now it'll go up to this forward pass and let's print out the size of the images just so we remember or image, image dot shape. Awesome, it creates our images. There it is, there it is, and now we can see that our torch size, so the size of your images, comes in the dimensions 9, 1, 28, 28. So we have a batch of size 9. We're passing in nine images, one the color dimension of 1, and then 28 by 28. We've been over this. Okay, great. That's what we're looking for. But into put it into the linear layers, 
what we want is something in the shape of this. We want it to be size nine by size 784. So 784 is 28 times 28, 28 squared. And that is what happens if we just line up our pixels. So we take our images and we just put them in one big line. So we're gonna to try to transform um, 9, 1, 28, and 28 into uh, 32, or sorry, not 32, 9 by 784. And Torch, because it is fundamentally a linear algebra library, it has great functionality for this. It's very easy to do. So the first thing we can do is do image equals image dot squeeze one. Okay, I'm gonna print out the image shape again, just so you guys can get a very hands-on understanding of what that's actually doing. Okay, squeeze. What squeeze does, very easy, is it gets rid of single dimension things. So it was nine, one, 28, 28. The one is useless, it doesn't really pertain any information. Um, yeah, for example, if you have a, a vector of size nine by one, that's the same thing as just saying you have a vector of size nine. Um, so the one was very useless. Okay, so that's what we did there. The second thing we're gonna do is to bring it out to its uh, original stringy length is use another function. So image equals uh, image dot view. And this is where we can give it its shape. So our sh its shape is gonna be nine by 784. So we have nine images and 784 pixels for each image. If we print that out, brilliant. We are ready to put that into our layers, right? So let's let's give that a little example, right? So out equals, let's start trying with our first layer to see what happens. Neural network layer one, we're gonna put our image. So that is what we defined up here. It's taking our image as an input and should output a 400 dimensional uh, component. So let's print out image.shape here and see how the shape changes, okay? Image.shape, I'm gonna say printing it out is one of the most useful tools you'll ever use as a data scientist. So we're gonna be using it a whole bunch. Um, awesome. Break images. Looks like I spelled something wrong. Self.nn layer, capital L. Okay, every single day I'm gonna have a spelling error. Every single day. Okay, comes out. Perfect. That is what we are looking for. We, I actually print out image again. I want to print out out.shape. So just print out the images twice for no reason. There's number two for the day. <laughs> so we got exactly what we wanted. We have nine images of 784 pixels. And now we put it through and we have those same nine images with their forward propagation step. So we have a, a, a vector of size 400. Okay, that is perfect. We have went through one hidden layer. Now, if I print out just the shapes itself or the actual image values, the, sorry, the, the, the results from the forward propagation step, I want you to look at something. Ooh, that is quite ugly, okay? What are we missing here? These values are not normalized. We have to use our activation function, okay? So we do that very simply, out equals torch, We've done this before, sigmoid out. So that takes your out vector and it applies a sigmoid function to every single number there. And remember our sigmoid puts it between the values at zero and one. So run this again, awesome. Now all of our values are between the numbers of one and zero. So um, if you guys know scientific notation, uh, which you guys should, this is number one, this is 0 0.12 zeros, two, three. So it's all in between where we are and they are normalized. That is beautiful. We are gonna do that for all of the layers. Let's get a little bit less boring and do some copy and pasting because it's a lot of writing. Do the same thing, except we're gonna be using NN layer two, NN layer three. And instead of passing our image for the second and third one, we're gonna pass it out. So we're just basically taking that image data putting it out and keep on just molding it, molding it and molding it and molding it until it gets lower and lower and lower. Um, finally, we will have or, out equals self dot NN underscore layer four out. Okay, now the one thing we don't wanna do is we don't wanna do sigmoid. We're gonna be doing something else if you guys remember. So out, 
print out and also print its shape just to make sure everything is working right. We should have a shape of nine by 10. <coughs> awesome. And we do nine by 10, that's brilliant. Um, we are saying right now we have nine images and we have uh, 10 classification predictions. So uh, these numbers are, can get kind of crazy. Uh, there's negative 10, one, five, five, all this stuff. Um, if you remember before, I'm gonna bring this up again. So I don't mean to be, I hope it's not too distracting with the PowerPoint, but remember we talked about something called Did I talk about it? Um, here, softmax, right? So these numbers kind of look familiar. They're between like the ranges of 1.3 and all that stuff. Doing softmax, we're gonna give it percentage value. So let's compare those results. So right now we have the uninitialized values, um, 4.41, 5.99, let's softmax it. Another thing, very easy to do. We have a very powerful library under our bells. So out equals, we're gonna to call torch.nn, torch.neural network, dot functional, dot softmax. From that, we're gonna pass in out. That is what we want to softmax. And the dimension is gonna to equal to one. So what that is gonna do is it's gonna take this dimension um, and it is going to softmax that uh, dimension together. So this is always gonna add up to one. This is always gonna add up to one. This is gonna add up to one. If we did dimension equals zero, it's gonna do it across the batches, which is very bad. It's gonna basically add up um, the zero predictions for every single image, which is makes no sense. It's not the type of question we're trying to do. So let's make sure that worked. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna print out just to make sure the shape is the same, everything says. Okay, so the shapes are the same, that's perfect. And now if we look at here, let's look at all these values, okay? So this is the zero label, this is the one label, this is the two label, three, four, five. This at the end is the nine label. If you look at our first, it is saying that there's a 50% chance that it thinks the first number is a nine, right? Um, our model is not trained. So it's gonna be random basically what I guess, but it just so happens to say, I think there's a 50% chance this is the nine. Let's look at this one at the very end. You can see that um, with the uninitialized values, they're kind of random, um, but our highest value is right here, 8.7071. Uh, and that also is a prediction for nine. That is gonna have our highest. So that says it's a 75% chance that it is a uh, nine. Um, our lowest, so our lowest number here, uh, negative 12, very, very low, is zero, zero, one, two, three, four. So our fourth label, zero, one, two, three, four, is a tiny number. That's a zero with five zeros. It basically says that there's a 0% chance that it is um, a five, or it's a 0% chance that it's a four, okay? So now we have our percentage values. We can start training, doing some interesting loss type stuff. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, we're just gonna return our outs. Make sure you do that. If you don't, you'll run into issues later on. So we have our two models. <laughs> They're ready, they're initialized and ready to go. The one thing we have not done is train. So remember training, before we can train, we have to make the optimizer. Um, we've done this before, millions and millions and millions of times. Um, so we're gonna do optimizer equals um, torch.optim.atom. We're gonna use Atom again. Atom is just an optimizer. It's a very nice name. Uh, we're gonna tell uh, Atom that the models we want to parameterize are gonna be our models.parameters. Okay, so those are the models we want you to train. It has a learning rate of 0 0.001, okay? Model parameters. Do we remember what we initialize as our model parameters? Yes, we do. They are our tensors, our A and our B. Those are our parameters. It's gonna say, hey, optimizer, change these ones, make my model better. And your optimizer will say, yes, sir. Okay, so let's actually start training. I have, just to make this code a little bit neater, 
we're gonna use a training function. So we have our training function, which takes our model. It takes a training data sets. So train data sets. It takes our optimizer. Okay. Let us get training. So uh, first thing we can do is we're gonna steal this code. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're gonna loop through every single batch. We have 9,000 or sorry, 6,666 batches to loop through. Um, and we're gonna perform calculations of every single one of them. So uh, let's just do an example before we do the same thing. We print our image. Um, so we're gonna use these images to train, first of all. So how we do that is very simple. You guys are used to it, or you should be at least. Um, Oh, one other thing, sorry, to make this a little bit clear. This is gonna be our prediction equals this. Let's print out our prediction. And we're gonna print out the prediction only for the first uh, image in the back. So what we're doing is you're indexing and taking only the first one. And I'll, I'll show you why. It just makes it a little bit easier to visualize. Now, the other thing I want you guys to do is to use another function uh, that I have given you. So it's called create one hot, okay? So what we're gonna do is where is it here it is create one hot we're going to call this our ground truth equals create one hot and we're going to pass in our labels okay so let's print out a bunch of stuff so we're going to print out our ground truths our ground truth and we're going to also print out our labels this should be ground truths, and this should be predictions because it's batch predictions. predictions. I bet you I'm gonna in there, <laughs> just my pluralization. Oh, I'm fine. Okay, ooh, let's actually ground truths. Let's also take the first one. I don't really need to print the image anymore. Okay, so what we are doing here, perfectly. Okay, so these are our labels. So our label for the first one, which I'm gonna make it a little bit more clear once again. Sorry about this, guys. So we're just we're gonna grab it from the, the first image in the batch for every single one. Okay. So what we were trying to predict here is a five. It's an image with pixel data that looks like a five. Okay. What create one hot does is it creates something called a one hot vector. And a one hot vector is a bunch of zeros and then a singular one. So it's, everything is a zero except for one index is a one. Um, what we're doing in this case is we set everything to zero except for our index five. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. And that is our 100% case. That is, we want you to predict that this is 100% of five. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare our prediction with our ground truth. So if this prediction is performing well, Instead of predicting 82% a zero, it'll pre predict 99%, 100%, 98%, 97%, very high percent, a five. So it would look like this would be very close to zero. This will be very close to zero. This will be very close to zero. This will be very close to zero. And then index five, this one right here will be 99. Something like that. Or actually this is index five, it'll be 99. So we're gonna try to make these tensors look as similar as possible. Okay. So, to, to do that, um, I'll actually, before we do that, let's get, let's get rid of these. And I just wanna show you that it does it for every single label in the batch, okay? So now there's a lot more. Um, our labels are five, zero, four, one, nine, two, one, three, one, which is like the image we had before. And uh, we'll see that this one hot gives us 100% the zeroth index. This one is at the fourth index. The next one is at the first index. This one's at the ninth index, the second index the first index, the third index, the first index, just like prescribed on here. And here are all our predictions. We have nine predictions as well. So we're gonna to try to take this matrix and copy this matrix. That's what a smart model would do. Awesome. Okay, let's get learning. Um, loss equals, we're gonna use softmax loss. And our softmax loss, we're gonna give in the, it's, it's, it's another custom one. So prediction goes first. Okay, we're gonna pass in the predictions. And we're also gonna pass in the ground truths. And that is gonna give us 
et variant. Name it, ground truth. What is that, error number three? I think I should uh, create a tally. Oh, number four. Number four spelling error. <laughs> ground truth. Okay, there it is. Our loss is 12.1569. Very poor. We did bad, um, which makes sense because our model is not trained. Let's try to make that better. So just like before, first thing you do, and each time you pass a new data to the model, you say it optim dot zero grad. You tell the optimizer, hey, optimizer, I'm about to pass you information. Get ready for it. Okay. Once you classify the loss, you do loss dot backward. That tells the optimizer, hey, this is how much you need to change values by. Um, and then you do optim dot step. And that tells the optimizer, I want you to commit those changes. Okay. Very, very normal. We've done this before. Okay. Let's train it. Awesome. It breaks, but we did one optimizer step. Um, I want to see over an entire epoch. So remember running through the entire test data set. One time reading the textbook from front to back, that's called an epoch. Uh, we want to find um, average loss over the epochs so equals zero. So what we can do is we can do average loss plus equals loss dot item. So it's adding all the losses together. And then when you finish the loss or when you finish the epoch, you can print out um, loss. And our loss is going to be your average loss divided by the length of our data sets. So we, it should be, if we add, if we have 6,666 batches, we add all the loss together and then we divide by 6,666. That is our average. Let's run this and see what we get. Remember before, when we were not training, if we did not train, we've got an average like 12. Now we're training. Um, awesome. So, uh, this is where I'm going to warn you a little bit. This is going to take a little bit longer than before. <laughs> I find that on these computers, we're using Google Colab. This runs the code on Google's CPUs. They're like super big computers. They'll give you a little tiny piece of a super big computer and they'll let you run your code on it. Um, on their computers, it takes about 30 seconds per epoch. So I'm going to teach you a way to get around that. But for now, we're just going to wait. Awesome. Our loss is main. So remember, we had a loss of 12. Um, now we're training it and it's already doing way, way better. So 12 and by the end of the epoch, so the beginning of the epoch, it was predicting like a loss of 12. Now it's predicting a loss of 0 0.795, way better. Um, but it's not great. It's actually quite poor. So what we want to do is we want to do it for multiple epochs. So we're going to do for epoch number in range five. So that's going to do a for loop for five times. And we're going to train it five times. So if it takes 30 seconds per epoch, roughly, and we do it five times, it should take two minutes and a half. So it's gonna take a while. So while we do that, let's get started on our testing. Actually, ooh, actually one more thing I wanna do after this, just to make sure, uh, just to save. Almost forgot, that would've been bad. Um, we just trained it on five epochs. We have invested our personal time into training this model. Uh, and we don't like waiting our data scientists. So we don't want to do it again. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to save our model. We're going to do torch.save. This is the very nifty torch save functionality that PyTorch has. Model dot state underscore dict. So state dictionary. Um, I don't know what that's there. And then we're going to give it a, a name. Ooh, so our name is going to be model um, 5 epoch dot state, okay? So it'll save a model called model five epoch dot state. Let's run it, let's train it, and then we have to wait for it to save because that's gonna do, it's gonna be the last thing that it does. Okay? Yes, yes, of course, sorry, my mistake. Uh, we actually have a little bit of time, so um, we can look through it, uh, right? Um, I, have, uh, I also have another solution to this we're gonna get through in the future for the time crunches. Okay, but uh, you should be familiar with this loop. 
um, our losses, uh, adding them together. It's getting better and better and better. Our model is getting smarter. We're really learning deep. This is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, we have our first loss, 0 0.817. So that's great. Okay, while that is coding, let's start on our testing. Okay, so test, we're gonna do that right after we train. Test, test, model. This would also be a great time. If you have any questions, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, so model, uh, remember our test function, this one only takes a model in our test data set. Data set. Okay, so now it, we are going to this function. So um, what I wanna do, is remember our question, it asked us how many we can label correctly. So what I wanna do is I wanna run through every single image we have in our test data set. I wanna see which one it thinks is more likely. So if it says a, an eight is 80% likely, that's the most likely it's gonna be uh, compared to the other ones. If, if it's 80% a two, then that is by, set, by, uh, by definition gonna be its best guess. Um, it is likely that it is a two. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to calculate how many are correct. So we're going to number of correct. So we have zero correct at the beginning. We're going to loop through every single one. So for data in test underscore data set, we're going to steal something from the top, just like before. Images equals data zero. We did this before. Labels equals data one. Um, See where we are. We've done three epochs. Our epochs are getting, or our loss is getting lower and lower each time. We're doing good. Um, that's a good sign. Um, we're gonna use our model to predict. Prediction equals model to pass in the images. Um, great. And we will print out those predictions. And we're also going to print out labels. Okay. Now, unfortunately, we wait. <laughs> um, we're almost there. We're almost there. It is, we've been running the code for almost three minutes. So it's actually taking a little bit longer. These, uh, the Google Colab, what it'll do is it'll give you some space to run your code. Um, but because so many people are using it, um, what can happen sometimes is they get conflicted and they make your slower. Okay, but we're done. Great. Okay, here's one thing to note. We got a loss of 0 0.2097. Okay. Honestly, if I could, I would train that longer. It seems like our loss is still going down, but we don't have all day. Um, let's refresh our little folder up here. We can see that we saved our model. Model 5 epoch. So we this is our model. I named it model 5 epoch because we trained it on 5 epochs. Um, so awesome, we've done that. Now, Let's say we want to reuse it again. We don't want to train again. Let's get rid of this train. I'm going to comment it out because we don't want to do it again. Um, we want to test. So what we can do is we can use this functionality. It looks like this. If os.path.is file, then our file name is model underscore five epoch dot state. This is just saying, if this file exists, if we have a file called model 5 epochstate which we do, so it should run this, um, we are going to run this functionality. Okay, we're gonna model dot load state underscore dict. So we remember before we saved our state dict. Now we're going to load our state dict. Um, and inside that, we're gonna call torch.load and then we're gonna pass in the name of that file, which is model underscore five epoch state. So just to make it a little bit clear, I'm also gonna add a print functionality to say print model loaded from here. Wait. Okay, we have an error. Predictions, ooh, typo number five, great. Okay, ooh, we probably should stop that too. Sorry, 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 great. Too much, too much, too much, too much. Okay, great, so model loaded from model five epoch dot state. So we have our trained model now. That is the model we trained, we saved it. And now let's evaluate some of the results. 
Okay, so the first image it was trying to predict is a seven. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It says it is a 99% match with a seven. That is impressive. Very, very impressive. Now, the second one was a two. Index zero, index one, index two. This one says it's a 98.3% match with a two. Our model is seemingly performing pretty well. So what we can do is we want a functionality that'll take from each one of these rows, uh, tell us the index of the highest number because that'll tell us what we predicted. Um, so in this case, uh, our highest number is 9.9 .9 to the power of negative one. So that's 0 0.99, that is our highest number. And we can do that very simply by calling this, the, this function. Okay, so max indexes is what I'm going to call this variable equals torch.argmax. That is uh, argument max. So we look up, we're going to put in prediction inside of it, and then axis equals one. So it picks, his, it picks the max from this row instead of from down. That's what it does. It does it on the first or the, the, the second dimension but of index one. Okay, let's print that out. Max indexes, and we can do some magic as well. And then this is pretty cool. Let's see how much we get right. So print out max indexes and then print out labels. Oh my gosh, we have guessed every single one correctly. We've predicted it with a 100% match on the first batch. So congratulations, we are doing well. Um, let's add some visualization to that. So we can print image. Um, we're going to put in our image, our uh, labels, and our max indexes. And that should make something quite cute for us to look at. Yeah, typo number six. Wow. I thought my props were bad. Typo number seven. Is it coming up? Image not defined. Images. <laughs> typo number seven. Okay. So it loads the model. And now it's making predictions. So we can clearly see this is a seven. Our model predicted a seven. It's a two. We predicted a two. All the targets and the predictions are right. Okay. So let's have some fun. Let's take a look at it before we do any calculations or anything. Let's just run it for a bunch. Okay. Let's just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's going to keep on printing out. These are from the batches. La, la, la. It's going to keep going. Okay, I'm going to stop it now. Okay. Now we have a whole bunch. Let's look through, let's see where we got it wrong. Cause uh, we didn't get it. Uh, I don't know if we got it perfect. Let's see if we got perfect. Like, or there might be some errors, right? But look, it's pretty good. Nine, nine, five, five, six, six, zero, zero, four, four, seven, seven. So we are predicting an alarmingly high amount of these, right? So with such a simple model, we are getting great results. Um, three, three, two, two, five, five, four, four. Usually it does not take me this long to find an incorrect one. One one eight eight seven seven three three seven four. Oh yeah, yeah. Our model is almost too good. It makes my job harder. Here, ooh, no, that's correct as well. <laughs> Thought I saw something wrong. Oh my gosh, when I was testing this, it's got all. Where is your test data set? That is the right data set. Okay, we got to print out more. We're too good. We're too good. So let's give us some more time. Keep your eyes peeled. Let me know if you see one that's wrong. <laughs> there should be. We're not that good. One, two, four, five, four, five, five. Da, 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 da. Okay. You know what? If I don't find one, here we go. Awesome. We found one that's wrong. <laughs> so this has not happened in my... Uh, when I practice for this, um, we have a target of three. So it's supposed to be a three. You can clearly see that this is a three. Not clearly, it's a little bit wonky. Um, I've definitely seen some better threes in my life, but it predicted it to be a two, okay? Um, so we're not perfect, we're not perfect. And it's gonna be very, very difficult to, oh, here, there's another one wrong, wrong one here. So you can kind of see that when it gets it wrong, usually I would like to say, it's not our model's fault. It's whoever wrote down the numbers because that is a pathetic nine. <laughs> um, 
it kind of, it can have troubles with the weirder looking ones because it's very used to seeing fives that look like this. Fives very typically. When you start doing stuff a little bit wonky or you don't quite finish the curve, um, it can have some issues. Okay, awesome. So I wanna see exactly how many we got right and then it's time for us to go home, okay? So how we can do that, um, we're gonna find our number of correct. And what we're gonna do is basically do that. And then another fun PyTorch um, functionality, it does element-wise, something called element-wise comparison indexes. So if you do this, if you take two, uh, if you take two, um, what are they called? Vectors or tensors or anything. Uh, if you do something that looks like this, a function, it'll look at every single one of the indexes. And if they're the same, they'll give a, a true value. So for example, let's print out um, indexes. What else do you want to print out? Oops, don't need that. Um, let's print out the label. And then we'll print out the number of corrects. Uh, what we're doing here is we are and this number correct max index is oh my gosh another what did i do wrong labels you gotta standardize the pluralization pluralization so that's what is it number seven i'm sure someone in the chat is okay, not okay. label is not defined oh my lord that's number eight okay awesome so great 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 great, great. so all these numbers um, element wise, it'll look at your predictions and the ground truth. And if they're the same, so these are both fours, it'll say true. These are both zeros, it'll say true. Uh, if you see a false, here you go, we have a false right here. Um, you can see that it's a, it predicted a seven, but it was actually a nine. So we'll we do that. And then if you want to count the number of corrects, um, you can just do, you can just count the number of truths in there. So number correct equals torch dot sum. Um, number of corrects equals true. So it just counts how many trues there are. Item, then number of corrects. Uh, oops, let's call this total number of corrects. So total number of corrects plus equals number of corrects. Okay, awesome. Then when we get to the very end, if you want to find percent, um, percent success, very easy. Take the total number of correct, you divide it by um, the length of the data set. And a little tricky, the length of the data set, we also have to multiply it by nine because that's our batch size. So remember the length of our data set, our test data set is 1,111, um, but we're using a batch set of nine. There should be 10,000 correct, or the 10,000 numbers. Um, so percent correct, let's see how, how correct we were. Takes a second, calculating, calculating, calculating. Oh, we should probably print that out, shouldn't we? Here we are, and we get a 93% correct. That's pretty impressive. For five epochs, um, I think we really did knock it out of the park. Um, so congratulations, guys, you guys did great. Um, one other thing I wanna bring up, okay? Cause we didn't have the time. I did us the courtesy of before the class started, I trained it on 50 epochs, uh, this model, which took 30 seconds a pop per epoch, 50 epochs, 30 seconds times 50, but it took about 25 minutes, about 30 minutes. So that's not the time I want you guys to be waiting, wasting on your Saturday. So what we're gonna be doing is instead of getting, this, instead of doing this, um, I want you to put in week three slash model.state. So all of our loading is gonna be here. Perfect. So what that is, is remember when we downloaded the code from my GitHub or the brain tank GitHub, it had model.state. That is our pre-trained model. So I actually trained a model, put it in the GitHub and I'm passing it to you guys. So that's another great functionality you can do with saving and loading. Now, when we test it, <coughs> oh, week three slash, um, Ooh, okay, wait, what, we, what happened here is I used, in, in my model when I trained it, um, I used lowercases. These ones use uppercases. So 
let me just uh, let me change that. So they have to be exactly the same. They have to have the same name, the same everything. Um, let me just change that real quick. My mistake. Um, should have uh, should have picked that out when I turned this out. Okay, now it should work. Okay, it loads the model, and now we get a ninety six percent success rate. So training it for longer time can get you better results. That's always up to a point. Um, with this type of model, we're never going to get something that's hundred percent correct. If the best performing models are like 99.98, but they also have more data, more information. They have deeper models um, and stuff that we're going to get into the future. So talking about images, uh, next week, we, we've, we're finished for today. Next week, we're going to get into something called convolutional neural networks, which is where it gets extremely cool, in my opinion. So this is cool stuff. We're working with more fun data sets. I feel like working with this visualization, these numbers are a lot more fun than working with Excel spreadsheets. Um, classification is a pretty fun topic. I think it has a lot of application, a lot of uses. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more deep into it with something called convolutional neural networks. And if you guys understand convolutional neural networks, um, you guys will be so much cooler than all of your friends because that is really um, where things get deep. This is where you can say this is a deep neural network. Um, Convolutional neural networks are uh, re a recent-ish innovation uh, in the timeline of deep learning. Um, they're used now basically entirely for image classification stuff. Anything with images, Teslas are using images, um, all that stuff. They're really powerful, really foundational, and we're going to do some awesome kick-ass things with it. So um, hope to see you guys there. Hope to see you guys soon. Um, next week, thank you for coming. You guys are doing great. I'm so happy seeing the same names every single week. Um, it's great to see your faces. I'm so excited for you guys to receive your diplomas and for you guys to get hands-on understanding of um, deep learning. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat uh, right now. But thank you so much and enjoy your Saturday and enjoy your Halloween. That should be fun. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stop the share. You let me know if you have any questions. If not, see you guys. Okay. Awesome. I think we are good. Um, you can reach out to me. Uh, you have my email. You have uh, the Instagram account. You can reach out to me in, in a multitude of ways. But it was nice seeing you guys. Uh, enjoy your weekend. See you.